man, but let's be honest, he just had money. What was his superpower? Insanity. Insanity. Thank you very much. That was his power. He was insane um, and rich. But did you know that we have superheroes, that was someone that had superhuman power in the scriptures? And we find that in Judges. There's a guy named Samson. I don't know if you know a whole lot about Samson. I'll just tell you this up front. <laughs> you do not want to be mentioned in the sermon of how to wreck your life, okay? Because he did not do what he was supposed to. And he, he would be a modern-day hero. Matter of fact, his name, which is odd, in, in the Hebrew language, Samson actually means little son. But when we read about Samson, he was anything but little. He, he was a very strong guy, like built. He you know, probably looked kind of like this, like looked real strong and built and, <laughs> and ready to go. Um, we'll edit that on the other side. But he, he's, you know, we've heard these stories in Sunday school. We don't know a whole lot of truths about Samson besides what we see here in the Scriptures. But what we do know is his life was not one for us to model ourselves after. Like, if you're going to pick a person in the Bible, and this is why I think it's interesting when people name their kids Samson, right? Do you know about Samson? It's like naming your kid Rahab. You, you want to you wanna kind of know when you give these Bible names. Um, but I, I want to show you how his life is not one for us to model, and I want to show you how we can avoid having these subtle missteps. How many of you know the problems that we end up having in our lives, the major problems happen because we make small missteps along the way. And it all leads to something bigger. So in Judges chapter 13, the Bible starts it like this. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman. How many times have we read that in the scripture? I see that quite a few times. And he said to her, although you are unable to conceive and have no children, you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now, please be careful not to drink wine or beer or to eat or, or anything that is unclean. For indeed, you will conceive and give birth to a son. This is good news for a mom who wants to have a child, but they've been bare and they haven't been able to do this. And, and so God sends this angel to say, hey, you're going to give the gift of a son. But in the son, there's going to be a vow. So we're going to make a vow right out of the gate. We call it a Nazarite vow. And so she's going to give birth to a son. This is good news to her. She says, you're, you must never cut his hair because the boy would be a Nazarite to God from birth. And he will begin to save Israel from the power of the Philistines. So the purpose that we see right out of the gate, Samson is going to be born with purpose. So God's going to give him a vow to separate him from everybody else, not to live by everybody else. Israel has gotten to a place. This is how quickly this has unfolded. We've been going through the Bible this year, right? And, and we saw it only took two chapters in Genesis before the world just went downhill, like really quickly. And then God raises up Moses. God uses Moses to lead the people out of Egypt, out of captivity, to lead them to the where? Where does he take them to? The promised land. All right, so how'd that go? Well, they, they get the land, they conquer Jericho, they go fight their other battles, they take over Israel, it is their home. Now, they've messed it all up that quick. Like, here we are in Judges, where God is physically having to send judges to bring judgment on Israel and to help bring them back to God. So this is Samson right out of the gate, that God is giving Samson to the world as a, as, a, as a representative, as a judge to begin to save Israel from the power of the Philistines. The Philistines are the worst enemy of, of Israel. Matter of fact, you hear the word Palestine. You, you've heard that recent in the news. When the Jewish people were pushed out of Israel, the Romans named it Palestine, which is the name Philistine. So it was kind of a slap in the face that you won't come back. So when you hear the word Palestine, Palestine, that is modern uh, terminology in the Hebrews uh, to the Israel people, that that is a representation of the Philistines. Why not name it after your worst enemy, right? And so he's coming to save this. So let me show you a couple of areas where you messed up. Young people, listen to me. In chapter 13, the first thing we see with Samson was he absolutely disrespected his parents. No amens on that from the parents? Okay. All right. And, and this is more than just if you're younger and you still live at home, this also goes for all of us who have parents, which is everybody in the room, right? That we, we don't disrespect them. But what we see as a pattern with Samson is he consistently, and, and this, is, this is the thing about it, he was consistent. I'll give him that. He was just consistent in the wrong things. But he was consistent in disrespecting his parents. He never listened to them. He didn't take anything that they had to say. He didn't take any advice. So when God sends this angel to deliver the message that you're going to have a son, and they give him this Nazarite vow, this vow was a voluntary agreement between a person and God to consecrate yourself to not be like everybody else. Like, we're going to set you apart for a bigger purpose. But in order to do so, we have to keep you away 
from the world, from, from being corrupted by the world. So in this vow, there's three different agreements that, that is made in the Nazarite vow. Number one, you can't have anything to do with a vineyard, okay? There's no wine. There are no raisins. I can go with that. There are no raisins. You can't even visit a vineyard. You're not to have anything to do with a vineyard. You can't touch anything dead. This means you can't touch dead animals. You can't touch dead people. Um, that, would, that would break the vow. Um, you definitely couldn't touch anything unclean. That would, that would break it as well. You also could not cut your hair. Um, there are other people in the Scripture. I don't know if you now that we've read those descriptions, there are other people in the Scripture who took a Nazarite vow. You, you remember a guy named Samuel? His mother also was barren, wanted to have a son. And after praying and praying and praying, God gives her a son, and her name was Hannah, who was barren. And God appeared to her, gave her the son, and she has Samuel. He was in a Nazareth uh, vow. In the New Testament, we see John the Baptist. John the Baptist was in a Nazareth. We, we know from the description of him, he was kind of rough around the edges, probably from Berkeley County, right? Um, he, he was wild. He, he ate honey and locusts, and he was, he was a man's man. He was in the woods, and he also, from what the scriptures show us, probably took the Nazarite vow. So this is not the first time that we see this in scripture with people. This is being set apart from a purpose. I find it interesting that when we do see this, it, it always ap appears with a mother who is on her knees praying for, for a child. And God gives them a son, but not just a son, but gives them a son with a purpose to change the course of history for the gospel's sake every single time. So when you committed to this vow, you were declaring that I'm going to live differently from those around me. I'm going to take on this life. Your life is now 100% committed to God. You're not going to participate in these other things. But what was the point of that? I think the point is this, that God is prohibiting something in order to protect Samson from something. So it's like, I, I'm not, I don't want you to do this because what if you do this, I'm going to protect you. It's, it's back to the illustration of telling your kids not to touch the hot stove because I'm trying to protect you from something because I have another purpose for you. And, um, and so what happens, God does, God does this through his parents. He, he uses Samuel's parents to enforce this, this vow on him, to, to live out this vow. And, and what we have found is that Samson breaks the rules. The first thing he did, his parents said, hey, don't go marrying pagan women. So what does Samson do? Let me go and check this off the list and find myself a nice pagan woman to go and marry. And so Samson goes and he begins to marry women from pagan nations. Now, what's the issue with that? Well, if you are a God follower and the nations around you worship idols, what's going to happen in that relationship, right? It's going to be a downfall because he's going to quickly uh, bow to the Philistine women whom he marries. And even he marries against his mother's wishes after mom said, don't do this. And Samson had people in his life to help him break the vow. He, he, he circled himself around people that would not be of any help at all or any accountability. And he did not listen to the voices that were there trying to correct the help to God to lead him towards living out the promise and the vow that he had made. Isn't that, isn't that kind of like us sometimes that we can go through issues and we have people that are telling us we shouldn't do this, this is going to be destruction, and we do it anyway? Let that simmer for a second. When I worked for, the, uh, for Marlboro County uh, Emergency Medical, I, I did EMT work for a while, and we used to have to drive. Uh, I was a low man on the totem pole, and we had to drive to Charleston to take patients to MUSC. Now, I know you might not think this. I grew up in the country. All right? I learned to drive a tractor before I learned to drive a car. I learned to drive a straight drive before I knew that there was an automatic. Praise Jesus for automatic <laughs> and transmissions. But... When I would drive to Charleston, Charleston had something that we didn't have back home in Dillon County and in Marlboro County. They had one-way streets. Anybody? <laughs> right? Turn on a wrong-way street in a Prius? No big deal. A 15,000-pound ambulance taking a turn on a wrong way? Not a good idea. And you take one wrong way and make a turn onto another wrong way, and you just keep going down one way is the wrong way? This leads to problems. Anybody? Like, so on, on our first trip down, I didn't know where I was going. They said the hospital. Why does Charleston have 15 hospitals? I don't know. And so we're driving, and I make a turn, and I find myself on a one-way street. And there's cars coming at me. I'm 21 years old, right? I just voted in my first election not long ago, and now I've been entrusted with a county vehicle 
in a, in a county that I've never been in. I'm on a one-way street. My, my, the medic in the back's like, you need to turn around. I was like, dude, how, how do you turn this around? He's like, if you keep going straight, someone's going to get hurt. So the option was to, to back up, right? That was too hard. I just kept going. When I get to the hospital, I have to make a loop in the ER. There used to be, at the, the MUSC ER, there used to be like a horseshoe you would drive around, and it had bushes in the middle. You remember this? I took out half of those bushes. <laughs> my, ball, my partner came back out, and there were trees underneath the, the back, right? What was the point of that? Because the destruction was to keep going in the same direction, putting other people in harm, putting myself in harm, putting him in harm, and not turning around. Because sometimes the hardest thing for us to do is to turn from what it is that we're doing. Because we think it's a lot easier to keep going straight, but it's more destruction than what's going straight than what it is coming to turn around. And Samson had these people in his life saying, this is not good. But he kept going down the one-way street. And people, innocent people, are going to get hurt in the process. See, there, there are people here this morning, you're heading down the wrong paths, and people are trying to tell you this is not the right path, and, and you're going to keep going, and it's going to lead to destruction. And you, you've got to, you got to hear me. You need to make a U-turn immediately and come back out of the one way. See, the sages of Israel would say that Samson, the reason that Samson had a short life was because he disrespected his parents. That's, that's pretty harsh, right? Um, and so they would say this because the Ten Commandments tell us that we were to honor our, our mother and our father. And it says this promise, you honor your mother and father and you will have, anybody? You will have a long life. Amen. <laughs> Memory verse. Um, not only did Samuel disrespect his parents, but he also dis disrespected and disregarded God's commandments. Because God, part of the vow was to do these things. And listen to, your, listen to your mom, listen to your dad, listen to what they have to say. They're there to protect you, they're there to lead you. And he didn't want to listen. And, and by not listening, he finds himself in trouble of constantly going back to the things that he was told not to. And, and, and not just disrespecting his parents, he disregards the very commands of God. Like, he's got a purpose. But yet, he, he's disregarded these, these commandments. He, he knew what was right, but he goes down the wrong path. You ever been there? Like, I know what the right thing to do is here, but the flesh side of me says... No. Any, anybody? Okay. I just, some of you are just polishing your halos. I get it. But there, there are moments, there are moments even in my life where I'm like, I know what the right thing to do here, but if God, if you would just let me backslide for like four minutes, just four minutes, and let me say what I need to say, do what I need to do, and just, what am I really asking when I pray that? God, can you just give me permission to break your commandment? Can you just, just let me, God, break your, break your word? I know more than you do. I know how to get at this. I know how to fix this situation. I know how to. And, and what does that lead to? That is going down the wrong way. That's going the wrong way. And it causes, it doesn't just cause, I mean, what, what are the two greatest commandments? To love God and love other people. And when I beg God to, to let me be disobedient to a commandment, well, I stopped loving people and I stopped loving him. Because those are there for my protect those commandments are there for my protection and to draw me into a loving relationship with God. So Samuel know, uh, Samson knows what's right, but but he still goes down the wrong path. He doesn't listen to the voices. And if you look at Judges chapter 14, so now we're going to jump ahead a chapter. Samson sees a bee's nest inside of a lion's carcass. Just a normal day in Israel. And he decides, I'm going to grab some honey out of the lion's carcass. So he goes and scoops some honey, and he eats honey. And then what does he do? He decides to put together a little welcome packet, and he takes it to his mom and his dad and says, here, I got you some honey, but didn't tell him where it came from. What's the problem with that? Seems like a really nice gesture. That was pretty nice. He went and he risked his life and reached into this carcass with these bees and risked the, you know, he didn't know if he had, you know, any kind of anaphylactic shock was going to take him, but he just grabbed the honey and brought it to his parents. What a nice gesture. Here's the problem with that. He was told not to touch anything that was dead. And where did he get the honey? From a dead carcass. But his parents are also holding the same vow. So what does he do? He trips them up. 
They're sitting there eating, oh, this honey is delicious. This is wonderful honey. Yeah, I didn't tell you where it came from. It came from a dead carcass. So you've broken the vow. So when Samson, (laughs) this is interesting. Where was Samson when he took this honey? Look in verse 5 of 14. Samson went down to Timnah with his father and his mother, and he came to the, what is that word? Anybody see a problem here? Ain't supposed to be in the vineyard, bro. Like, you made a promise, and you're, you're where you're not supposed to be, and now you're doing what you're not supposed to be doing. You're not supposed to be in a vineyard. And you're not supposed to touch dead things. And you wouldn't have gotten that honey from that dead carcass had you not been in the vineyard to start with. Y'all ever had these conversations with your kids? Well, had you not done this, then this would not have happened. Well, I don't I didn't do that. That wasn't me. This, is, it's this whole back and forth, I was the master of that as a kid. And my kids have mastered it for me, I guess. But, but he's not supposed to be in, in these vineyards. I love what Warren Wearsby says. He says when... When Samson ate the honey from the lion's carcass, he was defiled. He was defiled by a dead body. And that part of his Nazarite dedication was destroyed. In the moment, it was destroyed. In fact, two-thirds, uh, two-thirds of his vow was now gone, for he had defiled himself by going into the vineyard and eating the food from a dead body. He ruined it that quick. How quickly? Integrity. How quick do we lose our integrity? You work your whole life for one moment of mess up, and you ruin it. Can't get it back. Never, ever say never. I would never do that. Because typically the thing that you say that you will never do, you will do. And then when you're called on it, you will overcompensate. And this is what Samson's done. He's saying, listen. I know what I'm not supposed to do. I'm going to do it anyway because I know, I know more than everybody else. No more than anybody else. His pride gets the best of him. So he's got a newly married wife, a Philistine, and he tells her a riddle. I typically whisper sweet romantic things to my wife. I don't give riddles. Um, sometimes she'll give me a riddle of, does this belong in the refrigerator? <laughs> Nope, honey, ice cream goes in the freezer. I did not know when I put it in there at one in the morning that that's not where it's supposed to go. (laughs) Anybody else there? (laughs) Okay, see, I feel better. Sometimes preaching is more for me than it is for you. So she says, hey, I I want to tell you, hey, girl, I want to tell you a little riddle. I got a riddle for you. And he works out an agreement with the Philistines. He tells the Philistines, if the Philistines, if you guys guess the riddle that I'm about to give you, I'll give you a prize. But if you can't guess the riddle, you got to give me a prize. So long story short, the Philistines begin to pressure Samson's wife. Samson's wife is pressured for an answer, and she folds and she gives them the answer to this riddle. I'm not going to go into the riddle. You'll have to go read that. But in a rage of anger, Samson gets mad that she has betrayed him. And I know you've had your moments where you've gotten really mad, but I'm pretty sure you haven't done what Samson did. Samson gets so mad because somebody told the answer, And he lost the bet that Samson goes out and kills 30 people. (laughs) Explain that. Like, that's how over, it was a riddle, man. Like, nobody nobody won a million dollars, but he felt betrayed. And so Samson goes out, he kills 30 men out of his anger. Now, this all stems because Samson was in a place that he shouldn't have been. He didn't listen to anything that his parents told him to do. And this has just been one long path of reckless behavior. The point of Samson is that he has taken the power of God and he's used it as a toy for his own pleasure and not as a tool for God's purpose. Now, how often are we guilty of that? That we will use position for this. He, he's not trying to help the people of God. He is trying to help himself. He's using it for himself. Because now, instead of destroying the Philistines, He's participating in marrying the Philistines. And now he's got his inside jokes of his riddles with the Philistines. So he continues on his rage. He uses a donkey's jawbone and kills a thousand men. What would y'all do if this dude was in our society today? 
Like he's going around killing people. Like he's at 1,030 people right now because of two instances where he gets really angry. And then in Judges 15, he gets mad again. Y'all see a pattern? You should be seeing a pattern now. It, but it, it's not going to get any better. There's not a happy ending to the story. But in Judges 15, he gets mad again, and look at what he does. Verse 4 says, so he went out and he caught 300 foxes. We'll figure the rest of that out later. That's, he took torches, and he, t- he turned the foxes tail to tail, and he put a torch between each pair of tails, lit them on fire. Somebody called Peter. Then he ignited the torches, and he releases the foxes into the standing grain of the field. He destroyed, like these foxes are running with the tails on fire. And as they're running through this field of grain, the fire's catching to the grain and it's burning up all of their food crops. He's like, this is escalated from just not, just don't go where you're not supposed to go to I am now catching foxes. Like, I've got a lot, I'll be petty, I've got a lot of time on my hands. I'm going to catch foxes, light their tails on fire. Who thinks of that? And I'm going to send them through a field and destroy everything you have. How about that? That's taking it up a notch. We used to tell our kids when they go to summer camp, no pranks, because it always starts out innocent. And the next thing you know, somebody's in the ER, right? Because it just escalates. It's, I pay, it's paying evil for evil, trying to pay somebody back. So there's a pattern. He'll do something in anger. The Philistines will do something back in anger. He'll torch their fields. The Philistines will eventually kill his wife and her father. And all this is happening because he disrespects his parents. He disregards God's commands. And ultimately, Samson discredited his calling of what God had placed on his life. After two failed attempts with Gentile wives, figures third time's a charm, and he finds himself another Gentile. And this time, this lady is named Delilah, not the radio show Delilah. Y'all know that one? Can't get that out of my head either. But the text says that he was in love with Delilah. He loved, he loved him some Delilah, but he also loved the first two. And Samson's name means what? Son, right? Little son. It could also mean light. Also mean light. But in the Hebrew, Delilah means darkness or night. Okay. We all know that the darkness hides the sun from what's shining. And this will be no different with Delilah. She will eventually, this just, listen, this was planned out last summer. I did not plan this around the eclipse. But she will eventually cover him, his light, of what God has called him to do. So she seduces him. And she wants to know where Samson's power comes from. I just need to know where the power comes from. Now, we know it came from, from his hair. This, this hair was a symbol of his, of his power. And it was, but the power was the source of God, right? So the power he had was God's. It wasn't his. It was on loan to him. He was to use it the way he was supposed to. So Samson gives her these little insights into where his power comes from. He's just kind of teasing with her about it, but he doesn't want to tell her. And the one thing we see about Samson all superheroes have the one thing that will cripple them. For, for Superman, it's kryptonite, right? And for Samson, it was just power and affection. Just needing to be heard, needing to be loved, needing to have a little bit of power. So she seduces him. And when she does, he cracks under pressure and he gives the secret to his source to her and his strength. I believe there were three reasons why he gave the secret up. I think, number one, he was prideful, and he believed that if I tell her, it ain't going to matter anyway, because I'll defend off anybody that comes to cut my hair. That sounds pretty, after what we just read, that sounds pretty, pretty much it. I think the other thing was, was her affection for him, that she was able to sweet talk him, and, um, you know, my wife has motivated me to do a lot of things I thought I would never do, and I, I yeah, and so I think there was some affection there. It didn't help that he was drunk and intoxicated in all of this. He does not, you know, drunk people do not make the best of citizens when they're drunk. Um, but I also think that maybe Samson wanted out of the vow. Maybe he didn't want it anymore. And why would I say that? Because I think it hints at it in verse 17 of chapter 16. 
He told her, in verse 17, he told her the whole truth. And he said to her, my hair has never been cut. I'm imagining like, he just, I'm imagining like long dreadlock type hair. It's never been cut because I'm a Nazarite to God from birth. If I am shaved, my strength will leave me and I will become weak and be like any other man. Why would you give her such clear instructions? I don't want to do this anymore. I want to live the life. And I think he thought that even if they cut my hair, he still knew the power of God was on his life. And I believe when he got up and his hair had been cut and he realized, uh uh-oh, he's gone, he thought he still had the power of God on him. But what he didn't realize is when the hair was cut, the power was gone. He lost it. He was weak. He He appeared strong. He appeared that he had it all together, but he didn't. He had a fresh new haircut and no power. No, he couldn't do anything. And I think about that, and I think about people that are in here this morning, men and women that are here today, who maybe you've taught the Bible for years. You've led life groups, small groups, Dave Ramsey, Financial Peace University. You've led everything. You've taught Hebrew or Greek. You, You have taught the apocalypse. You, you've taught everything. You've been involved in the church. That This is all you've done. You've taught the Bible for years. You may have felt like this is a calling on your life, but one thing leads to another, and now you're so far away from God. It's not even funny because you have drifted, and it doesn't happen overnight. Downfalls do not happen overnight. They happen in subtle steps along the way. The reason that we leave God is because of unconfessed sin, that we will not deal with sin that we need to confess. And it builds, and it builds. And unconfessed sin always leads down the path of the wrong way. And if you're in unconfessed sin, confess. Just confess it. Samson never confessed his sin. In chapter 16, uh, he is shackled. And the Philistines gouged his eyes out. You had a bad morning? They gouged his eyes out. Can, I can't even imagine the pain of that happening. These people he's married into, he thinks they're his friend. He's got his jokes with them. They were just using him to get what they wanted. Choose your friends wisely. And now they've gouged his eyes out. He is shackled. And God took away the very thing that was a stumbling block in his life, and they pulled it out of him. And now we see the result of a life that was supposed to be lived from God. It has completely collapsed in shambles. Samson has dragged the name of God through the mud. Look at Judges 16, verse 23. It says, Now the Philistine leaders gathered together to offer great sacrifice to their god, Dagon. Now, the only worshiping that should have been happening here is is Israel worshiping the conquering of the Philistines. That was what Samson was supposed to do. But instead of God getting the praise, the false gods get the worship, and and the Philistine people are rejoicing, because look what Dagon did. Look what Dagon. By the way, Dagon's going to come up again, because they're going to steal the Ark of the Covenant, the Philistines will, and they'll bring it back and put it in front of the god Dagon. And when they come back in the temple the next day, the God has fallen in front of the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God. And they do this three times where they realize this box is probably a problem. We should get rid of it. And it says they rejoiced and said, Our God has handed over our enemy Samson to us. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. And they said, Our God has handed us over over to us, our enemy who destroyed our land and who multiplied our are dead. Like they're rejoicing because they see this as an opportunity. Look at our God. Look at our, our false God. Look at him. Thy God has, has ruled. And I don't know about you. I would rather die than disgrace God's name. We, we talk about, you know, the, the Ten Commandments of keep, you know, don't take the Lord's name in vain. And we always think that's about our speech. But it's also about our lifestyle to claim that we are a follower, but yet we don't follow. And this is what we see here. Samson has literally made a mockery of God's name. The the one that should have been upholding and apart from the world has fallen deeply into it to the point where instead of them worshiping God, they're worshiping their own God. That is so far from where it started 
when the gift was given to his mom of him and this Nazarite vow. So how do we avoid this? What do we learn from Samuel? I mean, it's from Samson. I don't know why Samuel's on my mind. From Samson. If your name's Samuel in here today and you need prayer, I'll pray for you. But, but how do we not end up like Samson? How do we avoid this? How do we not waste our life? Let me give you three things not to wreck your life. Number one, you need to understand that God will accomplish his plans in spite of our sin. He doesn't need us. He wants to use us. We're his creation. And if we follow him and do the things that he's commanded, there are blessings on that side of it. But he doesn't have to. And I think a lot of times that we're arrogant to think he needs me. And if I don't do this, what's going to happen? Um, you're just not going to get the blessing. I mean, Pharaoh said that he, he wasn't going to be used by God. You see what happened to him? He hardened his heart. God will accomplish this plans in spite of sin. As bad as Samson's sin was, God still carried out his will. The Israelites eventually will take over the Philistines. There are no more Philistines. And we see a connection between the sovereignty of God and the free will of men here in, in Judges. God will still free the Israelites from the Philistines in spite of Samson. We see it in Judges 16.22. He says this, But his hair began to grow back after it had been shaved. What God's going to do is use his strength one more time to carry out his plans. He's lost his strength. But he's going to give him his strength back. But it's not going to go well for Samson. Because what Samson is about to do is destroy more people in his death than he did in his entire life. And he's going to bring the whole building down and collapse when he pulls the columns. And it's going to fall and kill everyone, including himself, in the building. So he will destroy more people in his death than he did in his life. This is foreshadowing to Jesus, by the way. Jesus will come to save more people in his death than he did in his life. And what I want you to see is if God's will doesn't rule our lives, he overrules our life to work out his will. He will. And you think about that. God's going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish, even if we choose not to be on board. I do not hinder. He can get rid of me in a heartbeat. You, you agree? I was asking, like, do you agree about you? I, I know y'all are like, yeah, he can get rid of you. I'm fine with that. But God's going to accomplish this. But if we choose to be on board, there, there are blessings that come with that. Blessings always come through obedience. We get to live abundant life, like true life. And Samson missed the blessing because he was so engaged in sin. So you, you got to understand, you don't want to wreck your life. Understand, God will still get his stuff done, his purposes done. He doesn't need us. He desires for us to, to be a part of his plan, to have in a loving relationship with him. Here's the other thing. You don't want to wreck your life. Guard your eyes. Guard your eye gate. What, what are you looking at? Because whatever we see, it, it filters through into our brain. We are so, uh, what, the way that God designed us and, and the way that we can experience things is amazing. Smells, there's certain smells that I can be reminded of back home, of, of, of like there was a perfume called White Diamonds. Every time I smell it, I automatically think back to my great aunt and go into her house. And it just floods memories. God just gives us that sense. I, I can see things. And when I see them, it, it that reminds me of, you know, y'all have those? That we're so wonderfully designed in a way that God allows us to use our senses to be able to capture moments and to remember things. And we have to be careful because everything that is in here comes through one of our senses. It's what we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we touch. I mean, why don't you touch hot stoves anymore? Because you learned that that was not a good thing. Some of us still have the scars. Some of you learned that I shouldn't be in these types of relationships because I've done it before and did not end well, did not go well. You got to guard your eye gate. Samson messed up consistently because he was looking and lusting over women. Now, hear me. This isn't just about men looking at women. Anything we fix our gaze on can be a problem because we will worship anything. We, we are designed by needing. We are needy people, and we are designed by worshiping anything that we see. It wasn't by accident that at the end of Samson's life that God took out the very thing that caused him to sin. He allowed it to happen. And when... <laughs> When an image gets upon our mind, it is seared upon our soul. This is the dangers of pornography. This is the dangers, so much of that. And this is why nobody wants to talk about it. 
because it's uncomfortable. But it's dangerous because what you look at sears upon the soul. And for men staring at that, what does it say to our daughters and our wives? That they're just objects of our affection to stare at. And it, it robs the design of who they are. It's dangerous. you got to guard against that. Little compromises lead to bigger consequences. I have a friend of mine who, for years, had a cocaine addiction. And when we first moved to Lancaster, he was sharing his testimony, and he had been clean for quite a while. And he was, at this time, 40 years old, still lived with his parents because he, he made a complete wreck of his life. And he was doing anything he could do to get by. And we were in the car one day, and we were, we were going across town, and I went to make a turn on, on one of the main, main streets. It was a shortcut to get us from point A to point B. And he said, could we not drive down this road? I said, this is the fast way. He said, yeah, I can't go down this road. I said, okay. So we just took the long way. And I said, what, what was the deal with not going down the road? He said, that's the road that I would drive down to buy my drugs. I don't want to go back down that road. That's, that's protecting his eye gate. Like, it came to that point to have to cut that off. Because he didn't want to have any more compromises. He, there was a restaurant that he would do the drugs in. He, he has not stepped foot back in that restaurant since that day. Because he said, I can't, I can't compromise that. Sin will always take us further than we want to go. You can get in the car. It looks like a, a nice little Corvette, you know. But it will take you way farther than you want to go. And it ends up being a mess. I think this is why Jesus says in Mark chapter 9, he says this, and if your eye causes you to fall away, gouge it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Where You ready? Where the worm, this is always, this is always fascinating to me, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. you know what the worm is? The worm is your conscience. Your biggest enemy in hell is you. Reliving when you should have. Why didn't I? For all of eternity. Why did I not surrender my life to Jesus? Why did I not make that decision? You'll be questioning yourself. John Owens, a theologian, says that you need to be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Sin is a separator. It's dangerous. And it will take us further than we want to go. So how do you solve this? I think you got to protect yourself from this. You got to get yourself into a group of accountability, the right voices, the right voices to hold you accountable. You, you need to do it for your marriage. You need to do it for fatherhood. You need to do it for motherhood. You need to do it for your future. You need to do it for your personal walk. You need to get yourself into accountability, healthy, biblical accountability. And not accountability from somebody who's not doing the very thing you're asking them to do. Right? It would be like, I, I want you to take me to the gym and train me, but yet they've never stepped foot in a gym. And they don't look like they have been in a gym. But you wouldn't ask that person to be your trainer. So why would we go to try to get biblical advice from someone who doesn't obey and live biblically? That leads down the path of the wrong way. You have to get into accountability. I am so thankful I've got men in my life that hold me accountable every single week. That they'll text. I have a whole group text with a group of guys. We meet every week. And they will just, boom, hit questions. Sounds like you got an issue there. Yeah, they're, no, not they. You, sir, are an issue. This is what you need. Is that what the Bible says? Is that what Jesus would do? It kind of gets annoying sometimes. But it's accountable. What are they doing when they do that? They want me to be more like Jesus. At the risk of, I don't care if your feelings are hurt, dude. But we're not going to let you live this way, sit in this, and then try to lead people. Because then you're a hypocrite. And we're going to love your church more we're going to love you in the moment. Accountability. you got to get yourself in a group of accountability. See, Samson had... No accountability. He was a loner. He had people speaking in his life, but he did not listen to these people speaking in his life. Because Samson is a, is a picture of the nation of Israel. God says, this is how you treated me, so let me show you what it looks like. And we have Samson. 
Samson had the power of God, the promise of God, and he blew it. And when you read this account of Samson now, it should cause every one of us to pause and ask the question, how can, how can, I, how can Samson turn from God? He had a promise on his life. There was no doubt that he had a calling. There was no doubt that his mom had heard and seen an angel. So how do we avoid that happening to us in our lives? Write this down. Satan works in isolation, but God works in insulation. Because we like when we go, when we struggle, I hear people tell me this all the time. I didn't talk to you about it because I didn't want to burden you with it. You just isolated yourself. And, and I, I've watched lions on Discovery Channel, and there'll be a whole flock of gazelles, and they don't all take out 20 gazelles at one time. They always take out one. And the Bible tells us that, that Satan roams like a what? A lion roaring. You know what happens when you hear the roars of a lion? That doesn't mean there's an attack underway. That is the celebration for what they just caught. Did you catch it? So when Jesus said that he roams around like a what? So he's already actively celebrating who he captures the enemy. Don't isolate yourself. Insulate yourself with the people of God. Satan works in such a way that he wants to get you alone. He wants to get you away from community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive and the more power sin has to run through your life. And like today, Satan will whisper, you don't need church. He'll tell you things like, you got this. You're self-made. I don't think I'm self-made. We all need accountabilities because we all have blind spots. Anybody agree with that? We have blind spots. We have blind spots. And the point of blind spots is you're blind to the spot. So the only way to see the spot that you're blind in is you need some kind of assistance. You need somebody to point out, man, you got a blind spot. You got a blind spot. And you need people to point them out. Here, you just need to find yourself, we have life groups that you can find accountability in. That you can get yourself in a community of people living the gospel, going after the same thing to be more like Jesus. Safe environments to grow and have your accountability. But you need it. And the, and the best thing for you today, if you don't hear anything else I have to say, ask yourself, am I in isolation or am I in insulation? And if you don't have a group of people who love Jesus that you're, that you're with, you're living in isolation. Okay? It's isolation. So your next step would be to push to get into a life group. To push to get into a life group. And for some of you, before you can take that step of getting to life group, you need to take the first step of giving your life to Jesus because you are all alone. And you're going down the wrong path. And if you, if you bow your head with me this morning, this is not a magic prayer, but if you, hey, if I, I need to surrender my life to Jesus, to his lordship, because I'm going down the wrong path and I want to repent and I want a relationship with him, just pray this with me. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. And God, give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges. I need you. I need you. And if you prayed that prayer this morning, when we're done today, I, I want you to go back, or even in these next moments as we're singing, I want you to just go back to the cross. We're going to have our elders and prayer team back there who want to talk to you, pray with you, help you get connected to our church. But would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the people here. But God, we, we are under attack from the enemy every single day. He wants to isolate us. And he wants us to feel convinced that we're safe by ourselves and nobody needs to know. And we don't need to talk about these things. But Lord, we have to talk about them. So I just pray right now as we worship and sing, God, that you would move in our hearts. I thank you for those this week who have surrendered their lives to your Lordship and those who surrendered even last week. Thank you for bringing them here. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus.